blurted out in protest. There's not but a piece of peace. Right, Mom? That's what you said. You told us there's not but a piece of peace. And you know, mothers can kick you under the table, but it always results in one thing. What are you kicking me for? Which makes everything worse. Hospitality's language was fried chicken in those days. What if we um, spoke the same language today? You know, now we say, well, uh, we can succumb to, we know about the cholesterol now. We count the fat grounds now. And the only one having any fun now is the chicken. And we can succumb to that as long as, you know, we know there are still... Um, there's still those casseroles. That's the new fried chicken, isn't it? Casserole, whatever you got, just put a can of mushroom soup with it and crumble up some cracker crumbs on the top and you got it. I mean, this nation has seen some ups and downs with the economy and some of our companies have been in dire straits, but you know, as long as we have church fellowship meals, the cream of chicken and cream of mushroom soup company incorporated, they will be in good shape, along with the Cool Whip, because when it's a dessert, just mix up some Cool Whip in it and add the light to the end of the word, and you got it. <laughs> People say we're just in it for the loaves and the fishes, you know. But there's also taco soup and banana pudding. So it's not just about loaves and fishes, right? It's about hospitality is what it is. But before that, it's about fellowship, Fellowship and hospitality. So uh, sometimes we tend to, I don't know, put the, this fellowship at a less important place or less prominence than maybe the scripture does because we turn to Acts 2 and it's like our same chapter. You know, we say the church started in Acts 2 and we can show people scripture, uh, um, chapter and verse for that. And baptism, we see 3,000 souls were added to the church, that you don't just join the church of your choice, the baptism. We use Acts 2 to teach so many things, but sometimes it breaks down for us about verse 46 or so, where we see that daily they went from house to house and broke bread. And there is another a verse in there about breaking bread that I think has to do with worship, but I don't think this does, because it's every day, for one thing. Daily, from house to house, breaking bread and eating their meat with simplicity and gladness of heart. Give me that fellowship when you talk about give me that old-time religion, because this dates back to the very first day of the church. There was a man talking to my husband some time ago and he said you know at the church that I go to and it was a little it was a different congregation it was the Lord's church but a different congregation than we go to and he said all they do is eat just eat 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 it's like every other day you know they're getting together and eating and I just think you can do that too much well I really couldn't disagree more not looking at Acts 2 because whatever it was that they were doing, how often they were coming together was probably actually short of the mark. Because here, it was every day. There's something about putting our feet under the same table that Jesus understood. You see over and over examples of what? Him eating with sinners, him eating with the twelve, him eating in someone's home. And so we don't want to miss out on this joy. I think that COVID, you know, we have BC and AD mean something different now, don't they? <laughs> um, BC before COVID, AD after the distancing. So we can define our lives by that. And so many times in the church, especially, we do. People will say, well, our numbers before COVID were this. Well, Let's put the B.C. back where it goes and the A.D. back where it goes and realize that COVID needs to be shelved and we need to understand still the hospitality and the fellowship that that chicken knew all about. 
Uh, you know, in, in Birmingham, where I was growing up, Brother Franklin Camp would, would teach a men's uh, preacher's class every Monday, and people would come from Atlanta, and people would come from uh, Jasper and Tuscaloosa and Anniston, all to come and fill their cup with Brother Franklin Camp's Bible insights and wisdom and knowledge. And then they would go fill their plate in my mama's house, and she would have that fried chicken. Well, I would get off the school bus, and I would see these line of cars up the hill, and I would think, oh, it's Monday. And it would be, what time does school let out? Three o'clock, then the bus takes home, it's four, and four, and then some. And here was these preachers still be there, and there was nothing left on the table but the wishbone. But they were enjoying that fellowship, that simplicity. Too much simplicity and gladness was there for anybody to be, want to be the first one to leave. I could hear the laughter before I got in the house. It's a valuable gift that we're taught in Acts 2 and beyond. The hospitality, though, uh, is also something that the, the chicken stood for. And Martha is someone who was known in the scriptures for serving, and she kind of gets a bad rap. Although we usually, all, every one of us, if I said, raise your hand if you think you're Mary or if you think you're Martha, well, everybody in here would raise their hand probably about Martha. And we get that this, this uh, little episode was put in there for a reason. Martha was about hospitality. Because in Luke 10, at the beginning of the story, that was her target. It said she welcomed him into her home. Now, every time that we have an opportunity for hospitality, and especially, you know, fellowship is one thing, but hospitality is such a close double first cousin there, but hospitality has to do with meeting a need that the person really can't meet for themselves at the time. She welcomed him into her home. Now we read other places that Jesus was homeless at times, that he didn't have a place to put his head, to pillow his head at night. He says in Matthew 25, and we'll get there in a second, that I had these needs and you met them. Well, Martha welcomed him into her home. So when we shoot for hospitality and we open our home, you know, we need to think of it as we are welcoming Christ into our home. So she started well, but there was the stress detour. Does that sound familiar? I mean, just circle a date on the calendar and that, to, to have people over into your home to try to show to some hospitality, and that will be the day that the commode overflows or, you know, that s somebody uh, says, uh, he, he shoved me off of this, and you look, and there's blood. Whatever it is, the stress detour. I don't know what happened in Martha's kitchen exactly. I don't know. You know, you can, you can think the theme song in your head for the event that you're going to host in your home is Blessed Be the Tie That Bones. But by the time everybody gets there, it's called, It's My Party and I'll Cry If I Want To. <laughs> because stress starts giving the orders. And I don't know if she spilled some beans on the floor, some oil, if she ran out of something and the store was closed, whatever it was, hospitality jumped out the window from the bed, bread pan in it, not the bed pan. I did that again. Okay, so... It, so she was stressed out. And stress and hospitality just don't go well together. They're not good playmates. And so she runs out of the kitchen throwing her hands up saying, nobody's helping me. Tell her, tell her to help me. It's an interesting that she's giving orders to the Lord there. And sometimes we want to do that. We say, here's my situation. Here's how stressed out I am. Lord, do this for me, please. And we start giving the orders. The stress detour 
But one thing, Jesus says, oh, Martha, Martha, you are troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that better part. You see, hospitality is the right thing. Martha wasn't doing the wrong thing. She just had a little motivation factor problem there. One thing is needful. Now, I want you to tell me how many pizzas you see here. Just raise your hand if you think you have the answer. She sees one. Okay, who else sees a different number? What do you see? You see one. 24? I think we got counting some of them twice there, and it's hard not to do that, yes. 23 is close. <laughs> what did you see? 20? Okay. Anybody else? Who said that? Well, you're going to have to take me out for pizza when we oh. get to Huntsville. <laughs> there's 20 little pizzas there, and there's one big pizza there. And what happens is we see the one, big thing, or we see the 20, little things. It takes us a while to see, to grasp the, the whole thing that's going on here. And sometimes in our lives, I think Martha was so concerned about all the little things that were going wrong that she forgot about the big blessing. Jesus said one thing. Whoever said one was right in that sense. One thing is needful. And what is that? We can argue about it all day. Some people say, well, he meant just, you know, just, just one dish meal time. I don't think it was that. One thing is needful because Mary's chosen that. A focus on the Savior. A focus on Christ. When we show hospitality to other people, sometimes we can get burn out. We can grow weary in well-doing if we're, you know, uh, slamming this around and throwing this in and stepping on the gas and hurry up and get, you know, we can forget what our focus is. But this is about Matthew 25. This is about doing this for the Lord. And this is about a soul, you know, hospitality is soul food, whether it's fried chicken or whether it's something else. It is a concern for the soul of someone. So we can get get misfocused and forget the big picture. Sometimes we have something huge in our life. I don't think this was the case with Martha, but it was about to be. We have something huge in our life, and it takes all of our focus. And we can be so fixated on the one problem that we can't fix, fixated on what you can't fix. Only God, who hears our prayers, who cares, can fix that thing that we forget about all of the 20 other things going on, 20,000 blessings. I mean, count your blessings is a nice song, but it can't be done. I mean, you can't count the number of things that have went right for you, that have gone right for you this morning. You can't. But we don't really focus on that. Do we ever come in... Slam something down and say, let me tell you everything that's gone right for me today. We don't do it that way, do we? We tell everything, let me tell you everything that's gone wrong for me today. And usually there's a blessing in the things that go wrong. God is orchestrating. Romans 8, 28. All right. So the Martha fact, she started well. She had the distress detour. She forgot about the one thing that has to be our focus when we aim for hospitality and then I said the one thing was about to happen take two because in John 12 we see Martha serving again it says that some people were at table in the house of Simon and Martha was serving of course Martha was serving that's who she was but this time she wasn't in a tizzy. This time she wasn't all stressed out because this time she had learned something about counting blessings because her brother Lazarus, and that's what it says next, was at the table. 
he was there. And what had happened to him before? He had died. Came back to life. And now, didn't really matter about what was on the table. Didn't really matter about the beans or the bread. I mean, back me up on this, you know. If you dump out the whole thing of dough that you're going to make for the rolls for everybody to be there. The oven's 400 degrees, right? So isn't that going to kill any germs medical professionals? Thank you. So it didn't, these things didn't matter anymore. Suddenly, she was, she was serving still, but she wasn't stressed out about it. It's more about your heart than your house. Luke 12, 14 or Luke 14, 12, it's one of those, look it up, uh, tells us that, gives us a heads up on that. Don't invite somebody to your house thinking that you can be, this important thing, and you can, I'm paraphrasing, thinking you can be invited back to their house. But invite those people who can't pay you back. So it's not about your house. I mean, which one of us does not feel more comfortable going somewhere where we don't have to cringe every time our kid gets too close to a knickknack. It's about meeting the need of someone who can't meet it at the time. But isn't that for a safer place and time? You see, it's not always about having an event that you circle on the calendar. You know, in fact, sometimes God shows us ways to be hospitable that kind of knock those things that we were planning to do <laughs> off the calendar because somebody has a need right then. And our grandmothers in this old-time religion were pretty good at eyeing that. And there wasn't anything that came along that a plate of fried chicken and maybe an orange cake couldn't get you through. But now, you know, it may be about the guy under the bridge that needs a hamburger. It may be about the family that comes to pediatric ICU and doesn't have a place to stay. It may be about something that you were totally unexpecting. If that's a word, <laughs> you were totally unexpecting this. <laughs> um, is it safe to do those kinds of things in our culture? See, sometimes we can say that was, that was for the Bible times because people don't understand the danger and the culture that we live in now. But, you know, Hebrews writer tells us to be careful and entertain, uh, entertain strangers. Entertain strangers. Because some have entertained angels unaware that way. Well... In the Old Testament, I don't know if this is a reference directly to this, but it fits because when Abraham and Sarah were uh, visited, they were visited by angels. They were hospitable. I don't think they were aware of who it was. And so it fits. But was it a safer time? You say, oh yeah, you know, that was an easy lifestyle back then. But what happens in the very next chapter? Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed because there are not ten righteous people there. You could not find ten righteous people in these cities if you were hard-pressed to, and Abraham was hard-pressed. And you say, how far was that? How far was that and how... Well, I mean, it happens the same day as these people that he was hospitable to. And it is, we don't know where Sodom and Gomorrah were exactly because when God annihilates a city, there's not a dot on the map anymore. But scholars tell us that it was, it was in the Dead Sea region, so if it was the very farthest part of the Dead Sea region, it would be 30 miles from memory. Is it only for a safe culture that we need to help those who are helpless? I'm not saying not to be careful. 
I'm not saying to pick up a hitchhiker. I'm not saying to open your house to someone and let them share the bedroom with your kids or anything like that. You have to use common sense. But I am saying that sometimes we're going to be on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho and there's going to be somebody beaten up that needs help and we're not going to walk by on the other side. We're going to take that risk. That's all about hospitality, not just about fried chicken and people you know and coming over and playing games in your house. Just some favorites, though. Favorite ways to meet the needs of those who might need some help at the time. Remember the widowers. Because these men, most of them lived in a time where men did very hard work, but they did not do much of the cooking. So I can speak firsthand because my mother died a long time before my father of how much he really loved it when someone would bring him something homemade. So remember the widowers. Make it go further. There's really not a lot of people who can eat a whole cake by themselves, you know? Um, if there's a big crowd at their house, if there's a funeral or something, then yeah. And you know, by the way, we're pretty good at bringing the food when the baby's born. I mean, we must think the mother is nursing like twin cows instead of a little six-pound infant. But that kind of pales in comparison to what we bring at funerals, doesn't it? I mean, there was a songwriter from Mississippi named Kate Campbell who wrote a song called We Sure Eat Good When Somebody Dies. Well, I mean, she pretty much nailed it. We eat good when somebody dies. So birth, we're good at that. Death, we're good at hospitality. People do a lot of living generally between those two brackets. You know, there are moves, there are job losses, there's hospitalization, there are broken bones, there are caregiving to a family member, unexpected company, expected company, gospel meeting preachers, whatever it is, a lot of things happen between those two windows. Well, this point, make it go further. So, a college kid, a widow, somebody uh, sitting up with someone in a hospital room can't really eat a whole cake by themselves. But make the whole thing and then cut it up. I learned that from a young lady who brought my father a slice of something. I thought, Look, what a great idea. And then I saw her go over here to somebody else, give him another one. Um, you can probably tell me many more things than I'm telling you, but just to share. I love to take breakfast because that's the start. That's the start of sometimes a hard day. And it's also overlooked some, sometimes. Let me just grab this or, you know, throw this at the kids. And, and we tend to, on these take-a-meal websites or whatever, we tend to do the lunches or the suppers but we forget about the breakfast. Little hands make it sweeter. Sometimes it's easy to use our kids as an excuse because they are so demanding. But instead of using them as for an excuse of I'm, I'm not at a good time in my life to do this right now, use them as a help because people really enjoy when the children are involved. So if you're taking something, let them do a card to go in it, or let them stick uh, googly eyes or M&Ms or something in the icing, or whatever it is, let them set the table, uh, because little hands make it sweeter. Don't even say, I don't know what to do. I would, I would be glad to do something if somebody would tell me what to do. I mean, we live in an era of social media. We are nosy, and we know what's going on in everybody's life. And somebody on there, if they don't tell you, somebody will. So it doesn't take five minutes to find a whole bunch of statuses, stati, which is it, to find those that say, you know, my mom had surgery today, or my kid knocked over the Christmas tree today. Those people need help. 
I was, I remember one time I was in the garage and this guy came by from church and I don't know why he had come by to, to drop off something and I was trying to get a whole bunch of kids ready for a ball game and I went out and Enoch had turned over like 3,000 baseball cards in the garage and uh, I looked at Maddie Ann's uniform and it was dirty and it was white and this man went to my husband and said, that woman needs help. Sometimes when somebody is getting a bunch of kids ready for a ball game and, you know, has one little enough to turn over all the baseball cards in the world, they just need help. There doesn't have to be a surgery. There doesn't have to be an emergency. Just realize the place where moms are sometimes, we can help uh, just by looking on Facebook and saying, well, let me, let me bring this by. You don't have to spend a long visit. You don't even have to do anything but put it on the porch and text the person and say, I just left this on your porch. You don't even have to cook because there's takeout. My friend Joyce has passed away, and I love her dearly, and I hope I make it through telling this, but um, she was, we, we had given her up for dead before then on this earth, but she came off of her deathbed, she said. She called, and, and she sounded perky all over again after we had given up and we had still prayed what did we think our prayers were for and she called and she said i'm coming off this deathbed and she uh the very next day at church she signed up for some things to help some people in a project that we were doing and then we got my husband got covid and she called and said um, i'm going to come by and bring some stuff for him and well he hadn't eaten anything I thought he won't eat this well she texted and I went to the door and she weighed big from the street and uh, there was a pound of barbecue there and he loves Waller's barbecue and there was Dr. Pepper there and he loved Dr. Pepper at that time and there was a dozen Krispy Kreme donuts and he loved that and he ate everything I mean he didn't eat all 12 donuts at one time but he ate it all and what did she cook there? Not a thing. You don't have to be a cook to be hospitable when someone needs it. The internet is about more, and social media is more than laughing at memes. Look at the people's needs. Look at what they're saying underneath those words. The example of hospitality, you know, in 2 Timothy 5, verse 10, we're told about the widows that we should honor. And here's what stands out to God. If she, has, uh, if she has brought up children, if she has lodged strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the afflicted, if she has diligently followed every good work. Doesn't say anything about if she's a ladies' day speaker our Bible class teacher, what is it? It all lines up what's valuable to God here. All of these things seem to me to be about hospitality. And, and it re reminds me, this, if she has washed the saints' feet, about Jesus in John 13. Oh, they all came to the room for that last supper, and no one wanted to wash their feet because that was a lowly servant's job. Where was that lowly servant? There was nobody there to wash their feet. So what did they do? They do what most of us do when there's a problem, ignore it. And so they ate their meal and then what? Jesus got a towel, girded himself, and began to wash feet. You know what, when we need a towel in the house, what happens? A big mess. I say, run, get me a towel. And then they'll come with, you know, the one that you paid $12.99 for at Dillard's. <laughs> Clean. I say, no, go get me a dirty towel. This is a dirty job. And we're usually pretty stressed out like Martha was. But this will give you a new perspective about when you need a towel when it's a dirty job. Jesus took a towel. That's all he had as a human right then. And a basin of water. And he began to wash 
those disciples' feet. A filthy job. 120 toes. Toe jam. Feet that had walked on dirt streets, the same streets that the animals had walked on. And then he says, this is my example for you. Do you know in all of Scripture, that's the only time that I'm aware of, that he says, this is my example for you. Everything he did is an example. I get that. Everything he taught and every way he lived. But here he says it. He says, this is my example for you. You know those nailed it things on, on uh, social media? They look like, I mean, the, the one that says nailed it, that's supposed to look really bad, that looks like the best I could do. Okay, those are like, well, if I could make it that good, I would be doing pretty good. Jesus says, this is the example. Now, what does yours look like? Mine's not ever going to match his. But this is not something really hard to do. It's just something that we think is pretty gross. Sometimes hospitality is about yummy fried chicken. Sometimes hospitality is about gross and nasty feet. It's about doing whatever you can for someone else. And then look what he says. Verse 17, if you know these things, and they knew it because they had just seen it, even Judas, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. If you want to be happy, do something gross. Wash somebody's feet. Change somebody's bedpan. Do those kind of things. Well, our next one is going to be about a song. Peggy already mentioned it. But I thought we would look at some of the songs we sing when we think about uh, Give Me That Old Time Religion. And these are old songs. And if we sing them, we say, well, sing out, you know, sing like you mean it. If we sang it like we meant it, would we sing these words instead? I surrender some. Sweet seconds of prayer. Less, less about Jesus. Each year, I'll do a golden deed, usually around Christmas time. We'll work till Jesus comes, or at least till football season starts. Let me live close to these Sundays from 9 to 10. Tell me the story of Jesus, but hurry. Are your garments mostly spotless? Are they white-ish? But one song that stands out is Give Me That Old Time Just As I Am. All 12 verses. Because it used to be when we stood up for the invitation song, people would start falling out into the aisle. And it wasn't because they couldn't wait to get to the bathroom. They weren't going that direction. It was because they couldn't wait to get to Jesus. The gospel message had been delivered, and it had touched their hearts. I don't remember the story I'm about to tell you because I was a baby in the nursery. My friend Susan was a baby in the nursery, and her mother Beatrice had her on her lap. And, you know, you get a different... This hasn't changed over time. You get a different perspective when you're in the nursery, right? Looking through the glass windows. And you're seeing the back of everybody as they're standing up. And you're hearing one person sing. So you get every flat note that the song leader sings. And so they're singing, just as I am, without one plea. And, and then somebody says, I think that Charlie, that that was Charlie falling out into the aisle. And Beatrice's husband is named Charlie, and she says, Charlie? And she, gets, she puts the baby in the floor and runs to the window and suddenly gets very interested in what's going on. And, you know, everybody's tweed suits kind of look alike back then. And she says, oh, what was he wearing? I can't remember. And suddenly, after 12 verses, because... What happened back then was after we got to the fifth stanza, 
the preacher would come and he would plead one more time for any lost soul to come to Jesus because it was too important. We would sing one more song and he would talk about what would happen if the Lord came tonight. And he would talk about, are you going to sleep tonight? And he just felt that compulsion that we have as Christians to make sure that every soul was right with God. And so we'd sing another verse. And then we'd sing another verse. And pretty soon, these people would move out of the second row. I guess that's why nobody sits there then. But we've got, at ladies' days, they do. And, and people would start filling both rows. Do you remember that? I remember those days. And so Beatrice, as everybody starts to, or Ber, Bernice, I don't know what I called her. I have a friend named Beatrice. I have a friend named Bernice. But it's, it was Bernice. Bernice, as they settled down, she said, Oh, it's Charlie! And she screamed in the nursery, and all the babies started to cry. And then she whispered, It's Charlie! And all the mothers started to join crying. Because there's nothing more precious than a soul coming to God. Look at Luke 15, the decision that is made. And then what else happens? What else happens besides that person deciding to come to Christ? In Luke 15, verse 10, it tells us that there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Now, people will say, oh, the angels are rejoicing. I feel sure they probably are. But that's not what this verse says exactly. It says there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Now, who's in the presence of the angels? God is in the presence of the angels. I believe that our God rejoices when we sing that 12th stanza of just as I am and someone gives their life to Christ because it's a lost soul, but not anymore. And there's rejoicing in heaven. We look at other conversions. In Acts 8, the Ethiopian eunuch, he went on his way rejoicing, didn't he? My daughter came out of Bible class one day and I said, tell me what happened. She had her little handout, her little coloring sheet. Tell me about this Bible story. And she said, well, he said, stop the car. I want to be baptized. Well, I mean, it's pretty much what happened. It wasn't a car exactly, but this chariot. He felt the urgency so much that he said, here's water. I mean, he, he's on a trip. He's a foreigner. But it is that important to make your life right with Christ that he said, stop the car. I want to be baptized. And then what? He went on his way rejoicing. Acts 16, the Philippian jailer. You know, you usually think of jailers as big, burly men. And there was an earthquake that night. Paul and Silas were in prison. And he, he thought that the prisoners had escaped because of the earthquake. And he took his sword and he was going to kill himself. And they said, don't do yourself any harm. He hit his knees and said, what must I do to be saved? Rejoicing's around the corner, let me tell you. When somebody hits their knees and says, what do I do to be saved? And they take the Bible answer, rejoicing is right around the corner. We can go that quickly from desperation to rejoicing because everything that matters has changed. And so they teach him the gospel. And that night, that very hour of the night, was how urgent it was. He was baptized, and then he gent he says that they rejoiced, and he gently began to wash the wounds of the prisoners of Paul and Silas. Life's change. What else happens? You know, it's an emotional decision. I've said in another book, 
that emotional decisions are not good ones. I'm talking about Esau's decision there. And I'm talking about our decision when we want the here and now. We want what we want because of our emotions. We feel good. It feels right to us and it feels good to us and it forfeits all of eternity. Think through. But this is a different kind of emotional decision. This is an emotional decision that thinks of all eternity, that considers eternity. And emotional decisions are the best kind there. How could you make this kind of commitment to Christ without there being tears of joy, without there being rejoicing and broken heart at the same time? It's an emotional decision. We serve an emotional God. Why I really love camp. Now this is a special ladies day to me. Because over here and back here, I have some super special friends. They're camp friends. And they're really not like any other. We see each other usually once a year. But oh, the bonding that takes place that week. You know what? happens at Bible camp, stays at Bible camp. Some of it does, but they know, they know what I'm talking about. Why I really love camp is not because of the heat or the humidity. It's certainly not because I have to string the same set of beads 12 times for the youngest camper. It's not because the bathhouse is 200 feet away and smells like I don't know what. It's not those reasons. It's because it is where people decide, you know, I've been pulled away from that world for a week. This is good. I don't want to be like that world anymore. But I do want this kind of fellowship forever and ever. And that is when many people come to Christ. That's the goal of it. And when they do, oh, there's tears. I know it's been a a hard week. I know it's been stressful. I know our emotions build up by that point. But I have heard some people brag and say, well, I don't get emotional like some do at Bible camp. I'm not talking about any kind of circus emotions. I'm talking about tears running down your face and giving somebody a hug. That's why I love Bible camp. Because hearts are broken and yielded to Christ and there's rejoicing in heaven. But if there's anything I want you to know, young people, if there's anything I want you to understand, is that you don't have to wait 51 weeks to go to Bible camp to make your life right with God. Jesus' blood washes away sins 365 days a year. And that family that you have at Bible camp is God's family and they're right here. 365 days a year. There can be rejoicing in heaven. You know, as Jesus' blood streams down the cross, forgives us of our sins. How can we not be touched by that? How can we cry at weddings, cry at funerals, cry at births, and look a spiritual birth stone cold in the face? Bring back just as I am, and all the emotions and hearts of joy that come with it. Give me that old-time love in everybody. You know, that's what the, the old-time religion song says, makes me love everybody. It better. Old-time religion, Bible religion, starts talking about love in Genesis and doesn't shut up about it through Revelation. Give me that old time loving everybody. Love everybody? Are we supposed to? 1 John 4, 7 through 8. If you don't know the words to these verses, you had not been in church in a long time. 
That's all right. I'm going to tell, you, tell them to you. Love one another for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. God is love. If you're in a church where there is not love, what follows? God's not there. Mark 12, 28 through 31. A man comes to Jesus and asks him a question. Sometimes we think, I'd like to ask Jesus this question. You know, I have yet to go to the Holy Lands, but I have always wanted to. And I may get to do that in 2024, I'm hoping. And I'm thinking about seeing where Jesus walked on the water, seeing fig trees that are like the ones where he taught lessons. I'd love to climb a sycamore tree and think about Jesus being on that street. And what would I ask Jesus if I had a chance to ask him what I say, okay, out of everything, out of all this life that I'm imagining unfolding as I'm here, what is the greatest? What's the greatest lesson I can take away? It'd be pretty cool to ask that. But it's already been done. So this lawyer comes to Jesus and says, what is the first and greatest commandment? And you know the answer. Love. Love the Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and with all your soul. But then Jesus gives a bonus answer. Jesus cannot talk about loving God without talking about loving each other. The second, he says, God thinks, I didn't ask you the second one. She says the second one is like it. It's like loving God. The second one is love your neighbor as yourself. First John 4 and 20. It's the same chapter we just looked at that had God is love. But then in verse 20, it says... If anyone says, I love God, I think everybody here would say, I love God. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot, that's a strong word, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. 1 Corinthians 13. You know, it's what we think of when we think of love. It's read at weddings. If I said to this group, uh, tell me some verses about love, probably over 50% of you would say first. They would say 1 Corinthians 13. It's the definition of love. And when does, this, when does this chapter come in Scripture? Well, it comes to the Corinthians. And they had some definite problems as a congregation. I mean, the book starts out with them saying, you know, some of us are a little bit better than most of y'all because of who baptized me, because Paul baptized me. And another one says, Apollos baptized me. So there was division over that, that kind of immaturity. There was parading of adultery, the kind that Paul says not even the Gentiles do this. And you're proud of it. There was taking one another to court. That kind of not getting along. There was abuse of the Lord's Supper. They couldn't even observe the Lord's Supper without it being a problem. There were so many problems here. I mean, if, if there was a magazine called Spiritual Immaturity Quarterly, their pictures would have been on the front. And here's all these problems. And sometimes we say, you know, I mean, I don't know if you've heard this, but I've heard this. I've heard somebody say, all my preacher wants to do is preach on love. Well, let me tell you, he better if he's a gospel preacher. You can't preach on anything without preaching the love of God. You can't preach about God. You can't preach about Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. 
You can't preach about heaven or hell without being keenly aware that God's love snatches you from one place and intends to land you in the other if you'll acknowledge and accept and obey. You can't preach about marriage. You can't preach about salvation. All of this is wrapped up in love. You can't preach the Bible if you don't preach love. And so here we have all of these issues that Paul needs to address and where we probably think it would be the least likely to be is where we find this treatise on love. Because he says the problem is most of those Corinthians probably said, oh yeah, we have love. So the problem is you don't know what love is. Love is a verb. Love Love suffers long and is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunts not itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave itself unseemly. Seeks not her own. Rejoices not in iniquity. But rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. That's something we can do. Those are not impossible goals. Those are not some ethereal philosophic theology that we can't attain to. This is everyday life. This spills over well from Sunday into Monday. And that's really what I'm going to end with is 1 Corinthians 13 for where we are as ladies. Love cleans up the fourth spill at the supper table without lashing out. Love listens to the entire plot of a Pokemon episode without yawning. Love suffers long. Love kisses boo-boos, rocks crying babies, and sews eyes back on teddy bears. Love is kind. When love looks at the Gucci bag and the perfect lipstick and the 14 karat earrings of her sister on the pew and then looks down at her own milk-stained diaper bag where she can't tell lipstick from a broken crayon and fills her ears to find that one lone earring after that upside-down communion thing, love envies not. Love stays up three nights in a row making costumes for the kindergarten play, and her name does not appear on the program. Love vaunts not itself. Love cheers the loudest at the t-ball game, puts a torn-out notebook page of a lopsided heart on the center of the fridge, and claps the loudest at the curtain call, and at the end of the day, gives God the glory in a faded t-shirt of a nightgown and a quiet, thankful voice. Love is not puffed up. Love does not argue with the referees in front of the whole junior high. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love misses the half price sale for the piano recital. Love seeks not her own. Love dashes up the stairs to frantic shrieks of panic, only to find there is a ladybug on the mirror. Love is not easily provoked. Love tries to forget the time that her snow village was demolished with a Tonka crane, the time a red sock was dried with her new white shirt, and the time her azalea was watered with a gas can. Love takes no account of evil. Love spends Saturday nights cutting out Noah's Ark and memorizing Beatitudes. Love drives for hours in the middle of the night to a summer Bible camp swimming pool to watch something that lasts five seconds. It is the greatest event of her life. Love rejoices in the truth. Love changes sheets in the middle of the night and camps out in the rain with the Cub Scouts. Love bears all things. Love knows that one day he will remember to put the lid back down. One day he will tighten the top of the two liter. One day he will know his shoes are untied without anyone telling him. Love believes all things. Love prays for a little girl she doesn't even know who will one day steal her son away from her. Love's heart beats off the scale when her son is on the free throw line. Love hopes all things. Love eats potted meat all week to buy a used saxophone for seventh grade band. Love endures all things. Love is there when the boyfriend is crummy, the spelling bee is lost, the package didn't come, and there are monsters under the bed. Love never fails. Now, before we leave, 
we're going to do the old time religion quiz and see who has the most old time religion. Okay, so give yourself one point for each of these um, if you can remember doing these things. If, and there's 10 of them, so you got 10 fingers, so, so just use your fingers and keep up with your score. If you could hear someone pulling into the parking lot late for church because the parking lot was Okay, we've got some hands up. How about eight? Did anybody in here get eight? Just one person. Okay, so you win the Old Time Religion Award, which is a divided egg plate. <laughs>